It's time now for perspective. How happy do you think you are? What even is happiness and how do you go about measuring it? Well, students at the University of Bristol in the west of England have taken a science of happiness course and it's been discovered that at the end of it, they were actually happier than those who hadn't taken the course. Well, my guest today is Professor Bruce Hood, who's the director of the Bristol Cognitive Development Centre in the Experimental Psychology Department of the University. Thank you very much indeed for being with us here on Friday. 24 today. Would you start by uh, explaining uh, what exactly this course consists of? Well, it's a combination of academic lectures about the science of happiness, but that covers um, some of the philosophy behind it, some of the economics, some of the neuroscience. So it's a broad spread perspective on the whole topic of human happiness. But in addition to the academic lectures, each student also has to participate in homework exercises or activities, which are evidence-based things, which we know make a difference. And then they meet in small groups once a week uh, to review the content. And then we also assess them in their happiness before the course and at the end of it. And we found consistently that when they take it, their mood is increased. And why did you think this, this was a good idea to, to offer this course to your students? Well, you know, I was just getting very frustrated that my students were complaining all the time about their marks and there was generally rising levels of mental well-being problems. So I wanted to put something on. And luckily, I found about a course that a former student of mine, Laurie Santos at Yale, had put together. And I contacted her and we shared the resources. And I thought I'd give it a go at Bristol. And we actually, it was so popular that we actually made it a credit-bearing course. So you get credit towards your degree if you take this course. And the one thing about it, which I think is really quite unique, is that there are no graded examinations. Now, you might think that's an easy option, but actually the amount of commitment and the engagement required to pass is really quite daunting for most students. Now, you mentioned that your students had to take part in uh, practical experiments, practical tasks. What did those consist of? Well, some of them will be very familiar, such as uh, writing a gratitude letter for someone you haven't properly thanked, uh, random acts of kindness, but also habits such as uh, getting some good uh, sleep. In particular, sleep is really important. Uh, regular activities, regular exercise, as well as uh, controlling your mind in terms of mindfulness meditations. And so there's a range of different activities they can try, and we encourage them to explore each of those and find which works best for them. And what is it then that makes doing things for other people, writing letters of thanks, that makes the person doing it happier themselves? What's the psychology there? Well, I think the major problem with poor mental well-being is that we tend to ruminate about all of our problems in life. So we get into this cycle of despair. And what all these activities do is they break that up and provide an alternative structure. And it's that structure combined with the altruism towards others, which I think creates this feed forward mechanism of positive uh, thinking. So that's really what's going on. I would just say that you know the lectures are fascinating and engaging, but it's really the engagement, I think, which really makes the, the whole sort of difference. And are the things you just mentioned uh, universal? Do the same things make people hap happy all over the world? Or is this culturally specific things that make us happy that we're talking about here? That's a fascinating question. And in fact, we do investigate the cultural variations in the concept of happiness and how it's expressed. But I would say that there must be some universals, and that would include social connection. Why we're such a social species, this is how we evolved. And so some of our greatest happiness and indeed some of our greatest concerns are derived by our interactions with others. And of course, this has been an extraordinary year, more than a year now, uh, when it comes to the study of social interactions, our, our lack of freedom and these are successive lockdowns around the world. Um, how have you found that the pandemic has affected the mental health of your students? Well, you're absolutely right. And indeed, for the general population, all the indicators are that this has been a mental health crisis, a disaster. And indeed, the students at University of Bristol who hadn't taken the course experienced similar declines in their mental well-being. But, you know, just to plug the course again, those who took the course, they didn't get happier, but they certainly developed re resilience. So they coped much better with the, all the impact of, of the lockdown. 
And how do you go about measuring happiness? That's a question I think uh, fascinates a lot of us. How do you even go about uh, working out how effective a course like this could be? Well, there are different measures that you can take, but probably the most useful one is simply to ask the person, what are you feeling right now? So this is a well-validated approach using self-report questionnaires. These are have been established over years and they are repeatedly checked for their statistical reliability and they're valid. So people who score low on these scores tend to reflect in other sort of poor moods, sort of they're withdrawn or they may have their appetite limited. Whereas people who score highly on these are much more animated and much more socially engaging. They feel better. So asking the person how they feel is probably the most appropriate measure. Possibly not uh, wildly surprising. Um, and earlier you mentioned uh, the economics of happiness. Um, does money make you happy? Yes, up to a certain point, and then beyond that, not not anymore. So if you don't, if you're in poverty, then money makes a big difference to your happiness. But once you've attained um, a moderate level of income, and that will vary from country to country, uh, when you work harder to get more of that, you will feel more successful but you certainly won't feel necessarily more happy. So in fact, you can get more problems the more wealth you have. And for our viewers watching who maybe uh, aren't in a position to take your course at Bristol University, what do you think most of us can do in our daily lives to improve our levels of happiness? Write it down. Get into the habit of keeping a diary and a journal. It's really good for a number of reasons. First, it gets you to uh, articulate what is the nature of your problem, to make it concrete, to write it down on paper, and then think about it relatively. And then when you look back, you'll see that generally things are not as bad as they seem. So it allows you uh, a distance and a time to think about things uh, more considerately. Uh, Bruce Hood, uh, thank you very much for that. A uh, concrete uh, advice uh, as to how we can all become uh, a little bit more happy in these strange times. Bruce Hood, uh, Director of the Bristol Cognitive Development Centre at the University's uh, Experimental Psychology Department. Thank you very much. Thank you. A reminder now of our top stories today. As pro-democracy protesters in Myanmar grapple with another internet blackout amid an ongoing crackdown by the army, deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi is charged with violating the Official Secrets Act. And on the fourth day of the George Floyd murder trial, a paramedic testifies that he thought Floyd was already dead by the time he arrived at the scene and that Derek Chauvin was still kneeling on his neck.